Um, so we are going to start. This is like our tour talk of the day. Um, Joseph is going to introduce um, himself first and then his tool called Raspraisy. So uh, a large applause, a warm applause to him. Thank you very much. All right. So today I'm going to talk about how to actually build a gigantic global cool group of Crace.io. So my name is Joseph Hedrup, and this is work that I've done together with Giorgio Scusius and Morris Beller. So they're also sitting here in the audience. You can identify them by the shirt that I'm wearing. Uh, so you might also be wondering what does actually Rust stand for? It comes from the word uh, uh, Precision in German, uh, which is in English precision. And I'm myself not German, but Morris is German, so he helped me get, give this project a wonderful name. So to talk a little bit about myself, so I'm, when I'm not here actually at uh, Fostem, I'm a PhD student at TU Delft, which is a technical university at, uh, in the Netherlands. It's actually in a small Q town. Uh, and what I actually do on a day-to-day basis is that I work on dependency management uh, problems. So, I, so one of the projects, of course, is uh, Rosprezzi. But I'm also into understanding practices and way we can actually do dependency management more pleasant and better for uh, developers. <clears throat> and before I was a PhD student, I actually worked on uh, pull request prioritization, and that as a lead developer startup uh, developed on that. So before we dive into actually the idea of uh, building a gigantic call graph, I was thinking we can actually revisit a bit what uh, dependency checkers or dependency management, sorry, how dependency checker works. As just a question, how many of you do use a dependency checker in general? Any hands? Okay, so there are quite a few. But I'll just give a bit introduction on how it actually works. So over here I have a cargo.toml file with some dependencies specified. And over here you can see that some of them actually have a version range to it by the tilde or caret symbol. And when we, uh, let's say, like want to do some type of security checking or find out whether our dependency is vulnerable or has some license conflict. We first resolve this, the version, and after that, we actually build a, a dependency tree. And this is basically like the top level dependencies, but actually, we do have more dependencies that actually depend on those packages that are specified in the cargo.toml file. And as you can see, I didn't, of course, go further, but this is generally how our dependency tree looks like. Uh, and in, let's say, like academia, we usually uh, build dependency networks to actually understand how package repositories uh, work like and maybe also understand problems like the left pad incident. So over here I have uh, three packages. So one is package A, B, and C. And what we do is that we join them uh, based on the same uh, package uh, version name. And this way, for instance, you can ask like, for those who depend on left package, how many of them would be affected if that one will be uh, removed? And yeah, as I said, we, we bring those basically version together into uh, a single uh, network. And then we have uh, call graphs. Uh, and uh, here I have a sample code, uh, probably Rust Pseudo, not exactly Rust code maybe, uh, that actually looks into what is, uh, sorry, that actually takes, uh, uh, it receives uh, notifications, but we don't actually do nothing with it. So how do we build a call graph in this code? Well, the first thing uh, that we do is we identify all the function calls and also the function definitions. So we have like, uh, is, uh, like the main function and also like is ready. Mm -hmm. And from this, we look at who calls each other. And then we get a call graph uh, like this. And in Rust, we can actually do this using, uh, for instance, like the LLVM IR code, which was uh, mentioned in the previous talk. Um, so you can, for instance, use the LLVM OPT, OPT uh, tool to actually generate a call graph. Um, but then, or it is like this. So, when the, so one problem is that when you analyze programs, you only get partial of it. And our idea is to actually go beyond the single program, actually into the dependencies and get the full picture of actually how all functions are called. So here, of course, we have the example with the connection and our own app. But we can also look at what, do, what functions do they also call the uh, connection uh, function. So we see here, for instance, like it calls uh, something like request. And the other one is like network link, uh, for instance. 
And uh, yeah, and then the second part that we do in this idea is that not only do we only capture the functions of it, but we also annotate it with the versions. And by doing so, we can merge two concepts together, which is the uh, dependency network and the call graphs, and together we get something called a call-based uh, dependency network. So you might be wondering, why should we do all of uh, this in the beginning? Well, uh, uh, as library maintainers, or even if you own something like Crazed.io, you might be interested to know uh, certain things, what's happening in the community. And uh, so for instance, like this is of course, this doesn't really exist, this is just a vision. So uh, you might, let's say like install Prezi, and then you run, might want to publish a new version. But then when you run it, you get a failed. And yeah, so the idea, why, why you got a failed? Yeah, you remove the deprecated function, but then when we look at it, why did it get uh, failed? Well, it's because you wanted to publish something that would affect 15% of Crazy.io. And a good idea here could be that instead of uh, making this as a problem for those who depend on your library, it can be put on a, let's say, like on hold, and maybe some further analysis can be made uh, on this. And then, as an example, so like the, maybe the limited threshold is 2% that you're allowed to break in Crazy.io. And then, for instance, you can also like analyze adoption. So here I had like two versions. So you can see, for instance, when you release your new version that uh, from today and looking back one week, you can see that there are 5% uh, uh, less that are using your version of 0.5.0, and there are 12% uh, more that are using 0.18. And there are also many more applications like, uh, for instance, like health aspects, maybe also licensing, security, and also maybe we can learn call patterns in general that can be for education purposes or other aspects. So the other question is like, okay, this maybe looks really cool, but how do we actually turn Crazy.io into a gigantic call graph? It might sound simple on paper, but actually it's much more difficult than that. So the first thing, how do we actually first compile 22,000 packages? Because in the uh, cargo.toml file, you don't really know uh, what compiler version is compatible, but also which architecture, for instance, because some packages are for Windows, some are for OS X, some are for embedded devices, so it's not uh, all that trivial. And then also the other part is what is actually the entry point? What, is, what represents a package? Should it be the library? component, should it also be the binary, etc. So it's not uh, that simple. And the other uh, per aspect is the version resolution. Uh, as you can see with the version range, they are time dependent. If you solve um, a package today and you do it one week later, it might uh, be completely different. And this is not an, this is also a problem that affects how the, uh, the complete graph looks like in the end. Uh, and then with call, bra call graphs, uh, call graphs are an approximation of how a program uh, is called. But there are two important aspects here. One is, to, one is with related to precision. So with precision is that you want to be sure that the call graph that you derive from the source code is exact and uh, uh, complete. And the other one is to do with soundness because there are aspects, for instance, like dynamic dispatch, which is not easy to handle and to sort of um, uh, give an approximation of uh, how it is, you can, for instance, like add uh, unlikely calls. For instance, like you might have uh, multiple implementations of a call, you basically create edges to all of them when you're not sure exactly which one it will do at uh, runtime. So, despite those aspects, I still went ahead and did this. And to give an overview of the approach, uh, so the first thing that uh, I do is to retrieve and build uh, the packages. So that means like downloaded packages, and then I did also some like uh, cleaning in the Kraken files because in some of the versions you actually on Crystal you, you actually specify path dependencies, which does not exist when you use it. Then I validate them and uh, build it. In the second step, I generate the call graph, and as I mentioned earlier, I actually did this with using the Eleven call graph generator. Uh, I know from uh, discussions on the Rust forums that there are different ways to do it, but uh, this was the way that I started initially. So the first thing is that you uh, get the call graph, you get like this very 
mystic function called identifiers, but it's not really arithmetic, but that's uh, Rust mangle uh, function identifiers. And then you demangle it. In this case, I actually used the Rust field tool uh, to do it. Uh, and then in the third step, I uh, build unique identifiers, which I showed like in the earlier core graph with the versioning. And then similar to the dependency network, I merge them uh, together. And then finally, once you have annotated and given all function identifiers their uh, unique name, you can merge them together and then you have your call-based dependency network. So the first step is, uh, oh sorry, I'm gonna talk two main challenges here. So one is of course with the compiling and then the other one is with the function identifiers. There are of course many other challenges but I won't have time to do that. Uh, so I did this back in 16 February 2018, so it's almost uh, one year ago since I uh, did that. And when I first tried to attempt building it, I got quite a few errors, which is of course uh, expected and didn't make me so happy. So one of them was, for instance, like couldn't load uh, like the source dependency. Uh, another one was, for instance, like uh, could not run nightly features. And then there was also cases where there's a custom build commands that I could not execute. Um, I was able to mitigate some of them. So for instance, like the first case that I show over here is, I did basically by using a rewrite command in uh, Cargo that basically gets the published version of the cargo.toml file and not the one that you actually download from the API. Because sometimes I have path dependencies and you don't, I mean, they shouldn't really be there, but uh, yeah, so that was an issue. And then with nightly features, so what I did is that I run a couple of nightly uh, compilers to get it working, but then that, the problem is that you don't always know what is exactly is the right nightly version to run for a crate. Uh, and then the last with custom build scripts, so one way we mitigate it is by installing a lot of uh, system packages. Uh, I learned recently there is actually one uh, Docker file that actually does have all this system dependency. I haven't tried that myself, but uh, there is a solution to it. And I think <clears throat> one important thing here which I would like to see in Cargo is that you can actually, actually validate that the package uh, can compile, but also that there are features that check uh, whether, you know, which version of the compiler you use, what environment, etc., being taken into account. And yeah, so now I skip out there, some other errors related to it, which is for instance like when I was trying to build that many of the, uh, packages actually uh, use a trait but incorrectly. So there's a lot of, of these type of errors, so I find quite few of them. And what is like the final compilation statistics? So after removing invalid manifests that exist over there, I had in total 12,000 packages, and then that went down to 72,000 releases in total uh, of those packages. Uh, and then uh, out of those, I managed to build uh, 49,804 call graphs, which is in total uh, 11,000 uh, packages or crates. It took me 69 hours to do it. Of course, I didn't do it on my MacBook. I actually used a cluster at the university for it. <laughs> and in total, I could build, at that point of time, 70% of crates.io, so which shows that there are some actually really good guarantees with Cargo and Chrysler to actually build uh, packages. All right. Then the other part is with the Rust uh, symbols. So I wanted to annotate version numbers to it. But then the problem here is that I cannot use simple regex to do it, unfortunately. So I had to actually build <coughs> uh, a parser on top of it. So luckily, uh, sorry, so you can see, for instance, like it has this uh, uh, Semver as core, and here's basically like the Semver version rec implementing the trait uh, partial ordering. And to solve this, I used, uh, uh, let's say, like a build on top of Sin, which actually parses uh, Rust code, and added these specific uh, Rust C LLVM uh, symbols to do it. And by doing this, I was able to uh, annotate version numbers, and for, in order for me to add, append the version numbers, I basically um, uh, let's say look at the cargo log file of the package after building it, <coughs> extracting this <coughs> information, and then uh, appending it to it. So I add first like the ecosystem that I use, and the library version, the module, and the function name. And this is the way I create a unique function uh, identifier. 
So <clears throat> I'm not going to do a live demo, but I'm going to show a little bit what you can do with it. And uh, the, I did actually two applications with it. One is, of course, the popular with security, and I also did one with uh, deprecation. Uh, <clears throat> I think many of you probably have seen this, of course, uh, not with Rust code, but probably with uh, JavaScript and I think also probably Ruby.gems uh, uh, Ruby, yeah, Ruby code. So uh, I tried this using the Rust uh, SEC uh, database. So at that point of time, they had six advisories, and from those advisories, I could extract 13 functions that were affected by some form of vulnerability. And uh, I did this using both a regular dependency checker. That means I looked just at the package information, which I showed before with the dependency checker. And then I used with my Rust Prezi to see the number of packages. And here we can clearly see the advantage of having, uh, doing it on the call graph level because we get more precision and avoid false positives. And as you can see, like, the numbers are much less, which means that uh, I as a developer don't have to actually really go through too many uh, packages uh, when I uh, have to see whether there are false positives. Um, and to see, like, is this result actually accurate at some point, or is this just uh, a lot of false positives? So I looked only at the direct dependencies and uh, analyzed that, uh, and I found that using Rust Prezi that it's actually three times more accurate than using the regular dependency-based approach. Uh, something that I didn't mention here in the slide is that there are some problems with respect to the completeness of uh, Rust Prezi because I do not get, for instance, like dynamically dispatch functions. Also, there are some problems with conditional comp compilation, etc. But in principle, uh, by doing it on the call graph level, we can actually uh, have higher precision uh, when we do such type of analysis. And also a really cool thing is that uh, uh, I was, of course, posting this on the Rust forums. I'm not sure if you have uh, seen it. But uh, uh, yeah, so uh, Tony from the Rust SEC uh, community, he added this feature with affected functions. So that's a very nice thing for me later on that I can actually easily just uh, import data from the Rust security database, get the function to fire, and then query on the uh, Rust Prezi uh, graph. So the other case I looked at was uh, deprecation. So I did a very small uh, study. So I looked at, uh, yeah, so for instance, like the, the questionnaire is like, how many will be affected by uh, a removal of a deprecated uh, function? So this was the main uh, reason why I wanted to do this. And so I looked at uh, functions, like using my data set of all packages, I looked at how many of them actually uh, had a deprecated function uh, by using this uh, uh, annotation. And I didn't find too many of them. I found from 11 releases with six pack packages. So with this one, so basically ones that were actually used by other people. There are, of course, uh, many more. Um, and I found that in total, those who were actually using those 11 functions were 311, uh, uh, let's say, packages. And those are not only top-level packages, but also transitive uh, packages. Uh, and if I would try to remove those functions, 52 of them would actually be uh, affected. Of course, whether they're actually removed or not, that's a different discussion. But this is some form of analysis that you can do with uh, uh, Rust Prezi. And uh, yeah, so uh, I really want this to be a community effort. So uh, the way I envision with Rust Prezi is that uh, uh, I would like to do analysis and do data-driven decisions for, for instance, uh, the Crater project, which uh, runs like a regression on Crater.io um, uh, yeah, using the compiler. But also, for instance, like the ecosystem work group where they actually try to find uh, crates that have, um, uh, for instance, like uh, not been maintained for a long time or some other problems in which it actually needs some uh, attention. Uh, and also the security work group, as I showed with one slide. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, this is a bit like a little bit what I really would like to, sorry, this is really what, what I want to go forward with. And uh, there are, of course, many uh, open problems. So this is actually a prototype. And as a researcher, it's, of course, difficult to find time with research and doing development. But I really hope to uh, make this uh, something that uh, actually can benefit the community as yeah, the wider community. 
And uh, yeah, so as you've probably seen on t shirt and also many posters, uh, uh, one way to actually help me to do Rust Prezi better is to actually take my survey. So uh, uh, unfortunately, it's 10 minutes long, but I would really appreciate if you could fill out some problems that you experience with dependency management uh, or other things or other point or suggestions you have with dependency man management in general. So uh, thank you very much. I'm ready for questions. So your question is about uh, what is the number of false positives in general with using uh, Rust Prezi, uh, but also like with uh, control flow graphs, why I don't uh, include that. Uh, so with respect to control flow graph, so because I wanted to build this for an ecosystem, uh, the first uh, level of granularity that I wanted to look is at, at the call graph uh, level. Uh, the other day is that, for instance, I can like slice part of the call graph. I mean, let's say like of those affected paths throughout the ecosystem, and do more uh, fine-grained analysis by actually extracting the call control flow graph for that part of function. So going one step level, level down. And with respect to false positives, so uh, because I'm using the LLVM call graph generator, it is precise, but it is not sound. So. It is missing uh, dynamic uh, function invocations. It cannot handle, for instance, like generic uh, uh, functions. So this is a big problem uh, in using this. And of course, I'm uh, trying to look for better call graph alternatives. So I would really like uh, some help here on actually how to uh, do it better, but also do something that is more, uh, let's say, like complete. Uh, for instance, like in Java, you have Suto Vala, which uh, covers a lot of features. It would also be very nice if there is something similar for uh, uh, Rust uh, as well. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, I guess this is it. Yeah. Thank you very much.